welcome to this conversation uh, with Sophie Woodward, Helen Holmes and Sarah Marie Hall. And today I've got the great pleasure of having my lovely colleagues here virtually in Zoom. Um, and we'll be talking about two books on methods um, that they have recently published. So there's Sophie Woodward's book, Material Methods, and the book Mundane Methods, which was good that you've got it there on hand. Mundane Methods, edited by, by Helen and Sarah. And I'll introduce um, the three um, authors very briefly. So Sophie Woodward is Professor of Sociology at the University of Manchester, and there she's also co-investigator for NCRM, that's the ESRC-funded National Centre for Research Methods, uh, where she leads on creative methods. And Sophie has a background in anthropology and is known for her research on material culture, everyday life and consumption. And Helen Holmes is a lecturer in sociology and a member of the Sustainable Consumption Institute at the University of Manchester. And Helen has a background in geography, so we're very, uh, uh, although uh, Sophie and Helen are both based in, 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 in the sociology department, uh, have very kind of interdisciplinary backgrounds. And Helen's work focuses on materiality, consumption and relationships. And she's also currently co-editor, um, co-editor in chief of sociology which is the flagship journal for the British Sociological Association. And uh, Sarah Marie Hall is reader in human geography at the University of Manchester, where she's also a member of the Manchester Urban Institute. And Sarah is known for her work in geographical feminist political economy. And she's currently leading on an, on an UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship Programme called Austerity and Altered Life Courses, Sociopolitical Ruptures to Family, Employment and Housing Biographies Across Europe. And uh, Sarah is also co-editor of AREA. And I am Vanessa May, Professor of Sociology, also at Manchester. And what kind of unites all four of us is that all four of us are members of the Morgan Centre for Research into Everyday Lives here at Manchester. And um, the Morgan Centre is known for its work on creative approaches to qualitative research. And this is a topic um, uh, that kind of unites the two published books that we're going to be talking about um, today. So I'm going to um, introduce the two books very briefly. So we'll take Sophie, you can hold up your version of your book again, uh, Material Methods, Researching and Thinking with Things. And this was published in 2020 by SAGE. And then mundane methods, uh, Sarah and Helen, one of you can hold it up, um, or both of you even. <laughs> mundane methods, innovative ways to research the everyday, um, edited by H Helen and Sarah. And the book was published in 2020 as well by Manchester University Press. So I thought we could maybe start um, by sort of uh, talking about, because I know that all of you have a long-standing interest in, in creative methods, so maybe talk a bit about sort of your interest in creative methods and how that has kind of led to your interest. So in your case, uh, your interest into mundane methods and then Helen and Sarah, your interest into everyday, studying the everyday. Um, so so if it's, did I say mundane methods? I meant to say material methods. <laughs> And that's something that should go into the blooper reel. <laughs> so Sophie on material methods and, and Helen and Sarah on mundane methods. So Sophie, would you like to maybe start? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think for me, it almost came in the opposite direction. I think I started off by being interested in stuff in material culture. And I, as I started to do that research, I became aware that actually a lot of the kinds of methods that I was familiar with were just um, kind of inadequate to understand that. So uh, exclusively verbal methods, for example, or even just how observational methods, how we can really use those to understand things um, rather than just to understand people's and also to think about the relations between people and things. And so I started to become kind of the uh, interest in material culture and the, the kind of interest in creative methods I think came after that because I was aware of this kind of literature and resources on visual methods and on sensory methods but I there was a huge gap or absence of any literature on material methods on you know how we can 
uh, use methods to understand um, objects. And I think what I found really interesting was the ways in which actually a lot of kind of creative interdisciplinary methods were the ones that were really helping in this area. So things like methods from design, for example, so like cultural probes type methods, or even what's called kind of art space methods. So a lot of creative methods there, um, like kind of collage or other kind of even photography based methods were really useful in helping understand stuff. So for me, these were kind of results areas that I moved into to really help me think about material culture. I think that was something about and that's why I wanted to sort of bring up the fact that you you sort of have these very interdisciplinary backgrounds and I know Helen in your work as well you draw from like sociology and geography and and, 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 and anthropology and so on and I think that's something we can maybe pick up in in our discussions is the kind of the interdisciplinarity of your books um, as well. Um, but then Helen and Sarah, would you like to say something about your own background in creative methods? Do you want me to go first, Sarah? So yeah. um, similar sort of to Sophie, really, just finding that the methods that I was using were not particularly always that useful for the things I was interested in. Uh, and my work is really consumption focused, um, but very much on sort of micro practices of consumption. Um, which involve a lot of materials and really sort of working with, with what people are doing within the home. So I was really interested to try and find some methods that were much more suitable for that sort of really mundane, to use the word, um, types of activities that we, we wanted to research. Uh, so again, borrowed from, from different, different uh, disciplines, um, design, art, etc. Um, and then obviously Sarah and I, uh, have worked quite closely together for a number of years and we were, we were always talking about the difficulties I think in, in finding appropriate methods and Sarah's got um, a lot of experience as well in other other sorts of methods that, that I've uh, not really dealt with before and we sort of came together to, to think about how we could apply these to um, mundane forms of research and who was out there doing, um, sorry my internet's unstable, who was out there doing, doing, doing what really? Sarah? Yeah, I, I mean, I very much kind of sympathise with what you both said. I feel really similarly. And I think for me, a lot of um, thinking creatively with method emerged out of doing ethnographies and particularly as a geographer doing ethnography, which um, where ethnographic methods are, are common, I think doing long term ethnographies isn't so much. And that's where Helen and I really started talking about that. So for her PhD, she uh, did an ethnography of a, a hairdresser's salon and, and I did an ethnography with families. And it was thinking about getting at those, for me, those everyday relationships with more than observation and more than talking. So I started experimenting with um, with some photography, uh, with diaries, with life mapping, um, with go alongs. And then when we held the Monday Methods event at the Festival of Social Sciences, I think that was 2017, was it, Helen? We, we invited lots of people to talk about the types of things they were doing. And that was when it really opened up for us that um, yeah. you're just seeing how much interest there was and um, what other people are doing. Yeah. And also then thinking about because what, what both of the books do very clearly is sort of sort of show that that these, and I felt when these books were published, I felt finally these books were so needed. So when I was reading the books, when they came out, I was like, these, these are sort of um, filling very important gaps. And this is where I'm starting to sound like a commissioning editor, <laughs> but, uh, but what, what, where are the gaps in the, in the kind of the methodological literature that, that you'd sort of discovered in your own work that then led you to want to do the work of, of writing and editing these books? I mean, I, I, if you, I could answer this one, because I think that I, it, it's, I'm interested actually in Sarah and Helen both talking about ethnography, because I also started, you know, life as an anthropologist and doing ethnographies. And I think actually what became, I became very aware of is that people do such interesting stuff around material culture, fascinating methods, um, such interesting ways of understanding it, but they didn't necessarily write about it. And so I think for me, it was really about actually, and, you know, I'd hear sort of PhD students or other academics say, what's the methods book for for this? And that there isn't one. And and I kind of thought that that was really interesting. It wasn't that the research and the methods aren't there and they're not happening because they are. It's about the fact that either they're not written about or they're not framed in terms of material culture. So I think often 
uh, you know, material methods, like some arts-based methods, there's lots of literature on this, literature on design-based methods, but they're often not framed as material methods. And I think for me, that became a really interesting exercise to do. And, you know, and I think again, that I was aware of the massive proliferation of literature on creative methods and on explicitly on sensory or visual, but there was just so little on material methods. And I think that I felt that it was there, but it just really needed to be explicitly thought about and focused on. And I thought about this writing this book uh, a long time ago, about five years ago, before I had my youngest child, and I kind of came back and realized no one had written. I thought I need to do this now, otherwise it's you know it's kind of it's, it is a definite gap. Mm. I think we were really interested in how we were looking across Helen and I were looking across it, the different disciplines we work in, and that there was all this stuff going on. And again, like Sophie said, that there were pieces in about method in papers and there were pieces in in uh, maybe books but not brought together in this way and particularly with an interest in everyday life so some of the key readers on everyday life the, those um those texts they're often very conceptually focused or they have case studies but there wasn't much about methods themselves um and i think you asked about kind of what really draw us drew us to um to want to kind of uh, dig at this a bit deeper and for me as a geographer interested in time and space and relationships I think what I always found was that there was there were methods that were exploring different uh, spaces of everyday life but not so much about relationships and across time as well so I think if I'm right in saying Helen we were really interested in just the sheer complexity of what was happening as a way to make sense of the complexity of everyday life. Agreed. Yeah, and what I sort of, what I particularly love about both books is that they are, they are also, they are in no way just these sort of technical how-to books, sort of methods books of this is how you, how you do this method. Of course, there's, um, that there is a lot of, lot of, um, there's a lot of advice in the books for people who do want to use these either material or mundane methods to sort of help them along, but but more than that, the books are very much rooted in these more methodological and theoretical discussions. So Sophie, in your case, it's about the ways in which materiality is so inherently a part of social life. And then um, Helen and, and Sarah, your discussion around, because the book does open with a very theoretical discussion about the significance of the everyday, but then also understanding the everyday, not only as a, as a substantive topic of study, but also as a, as, a, as a methodological approach. So would you like to say a bit more about kind of your choice in approaching the writing of this book in this way, so that it, it, is, a, it is a theoretical engagement uh, with these debates as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for, from my perspective that uh, I think I consider sort of the audience to my book to be twofold one is people who do research in material culture and know all of these debates around materiality and they want to think about methods but also for the other audience would be people who are interested in creative methods and want to explore this they don't necessarily they aren't necessarily inherently interested in materiality or material culture and I think particularly for those people it is really about understanding that it isn't just another method to kind of add to the repertoire it is actually really about engaging with stuff and things and that you can't really do the methods without doing it so even if you do say one of the most common methods would be something like an object interview you can't do it without really having an understanding of the thing itself and also having your own understanding because there's so many different approaches to what an object is what a thing is and um, and I don't in any way want to be prescriptive about that but I think that actually it's just about encouraging people to think that they need to engage with those questions because methods aren't separate and and a, a final point to say is that I have I'm really interested in the relationship between theory and methods because I think the way in which we write journal articles sort of presumes theory then methods then empirical which we all know in practice is nonsense like none of us sit and decide on our theory and then the methods that match actually it's much more kind of going in between methods theory and empirical and I think I really wanted to explore that a little bit in terms of this particular area because I think that methods are so theoretical empirical they're not never just uh, I use my recorder to do this and that was something that I really wanted to engage with. I think I can add a little bit to that I'm sure as well part of the aim with the book was that we wanted it to be a really broad audience so we wanted 
undergrads to be able to pick it up and use it, postgrads, um, established researchers. So it was getting that balance right, really, between the theory and the the um, the more methodological approach, practical side. Um, so we wanted something there that would engage those who were, were interested, perhaps more in exploring the theory more. And I totally agree with Sophie's point that it's not one than the other. It needs to be uh, much more sort of integrated. Um, but we also wanted it to be um, an easy sort of pick up and go, oh, well, someone did this. My research is similar. Maybe I could have a go at that method when I'm jogging or walking or on a surfboard, etc. cetera. Um, just to give an example. As we all do. <laughs> yeah, just do, yeah. Um, just that's on the mobility section, I should add there. But something that was easy enough for people to pick up and engage with at quite a more of a very practical level, but also could understand that theory behind it as well and to give it that grounding within the everyday and obviously, you know, the mundane aspects and what we mean by uh, mundane methods as well. Yeah, I, I totally exactly what you're both saying. I think it's this delicate balance, isn't it, between uh, ensuring that we take our uh, these these different fields of interest seriously and showing that they have a longer trajectory and that they could be taken seriously in theory and in practice, but then also showing that they're really exciting and interesting. And I think one thing that Helen and I really had to work around was how do we make sure that the text is accessible whilst also getting at this complexity I mentioned before? And we jigged around with the different themes that we should have. And in the end, I think we settled on um, a section on uh, materials um, and memories, one on um, senses and emotions and one on uh, mobilities and motion. I had to try and think about how, how we could make sure that readers would pick up the book but then also be able to access some of these sometimes can feel quite dense conversations uh, with something that had a, an obvious in to it. Yeah and um, I thought we could now sort of just sort of sort of um, go slightly deeper into the books I'm not going to quiz you about them but just to give a flavour of the kinds of things that, that, that you're kind of drawing upon or, or talking about in the in the book so um, so if you, for example, one of one of the things, because there's there's so much, I mean, your book is so rich because it does go through the different theoretical approaches to materiality and the materiality of social life, and then also goes through different methodological approaches. And and I mean, I loved all of the chapters, but one that that I particularly found interesting, maybe because it was new to me, apart from I'd heard Sophie talking about this in meetings, but to read it was fascinating, was for example, the chapter on cultural probes as material provocations, because I think this really speaks to the kind of methods as playful and open ended. So your book is very much also a kind of a, I wouldn't say a challenge to social scientists, but it is an encouragement to social scientists that we, we, we can be more playful, more experimental with the kinds of things that we do um, out in the field. So do you want to just, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here. But that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> but I know that you know cultural probes quite well, but could you yeah. just say a few words about cultural probes, for example, and how they might work? Sure, yeah. So it's it's a method that originates in design. Uh, so Bill Gaver and his team created it. And it's actually relatively new. I think, it, I can't remember the exact year, about 1999 kind of time that it was first created. It was created in the world of design to think, instead of thinking there's a problem, how can we design something to solve it? It was des designed to be kind of open-ended, experimental, explorative, and, and also to kind of on challenge assumptions so they did it with older people and they use kind of playful methods and actually playfulness and older people often is not an association people have so um it was incredibly influential it's been used in lots of different ways and bill gaver himself has been very critical of how it's been used in disciplines like sociology because he says what they do is they just use it to kind of make things look a bit more interesting or they try and shoehorn it into how sociological research might ordinarily take place so sorry he doesn't just target sociology but um and I found that really interesting because I think actually there's a lot loads of ways in which we can apply this to sociology or to other kinds of disciplines but I think the key is it's about thinking differently about how it's done and we cannot use it to say right okay I'm going to generate systematic data on people's experiences of this particular thing by using cultural probes by definition, they are open-ended and they are playful. And I think that I find that challenging and I think it is challenging to us. It's a kind of shift in how we think. And actually often I think qualitative research more broadly has had to defend itself against you know, quantitative research and 
the sense which you have to be rigorous. And of course we do, but rigor shouldn't have to mean that you're generating systematic data. And actually the idea that you can use methods to kind of be playful and explorative and, and also acknowledge that it might not work. So you could do a cultural probe and generate rubbish data or just get nothing. And actually that's kind of part of the process. And I think that we are not necessarily always that well equipped to do that. And so I think it's really challenging, but there's so much potential in there for for, for using methods that provoke people to think differently, but also to provoke us, to provoke us as researchers to think differently about our topics. You know, if we're using a kind of playful methods with older people, it challenges us to think differently about preconceptions, for example, about aging populations. And I kind of love the idea of a method as challenging us, as not just challenging the people that we research with, but also us and making us think differently. And I think for me, that's what methods should really do. Um, and that's kind of what, you know, something like cultural probes kind of allows us to do. Yeah, and I think that playfulness as well, it, it just to make a plug for the work of a, of a Morgan Centre colleague of ours, um, Jennifer Mason's uh, paper on facet methodology. And, and one, of, one of the kind of the important messages in that is, is, is again, that similar encouragement for social scientists to, to dare to be playful, um, because we tend, we, we're sometimes a bit too serious maybe, I mean, we do serious work, but we don't, not all of it has to be deadly serious, that there can be a playfulness uh, involved. And that playfulness can be very important in terms of learning new things. And like you said, so for challenging us as well. So I like, I like that formulation that it is challenging us to think differently and maybe, maybe unsettling our previously preconceived ways of thinking about things in people's, uh, people's lives. Yeah. Um, and then sort of going to Helen and Sarah's book, like you said, there's these three, there's these three se sections, a section on materiality and memories, and the second one is senses and emotions. And then the final section is, is mobility and um, mobility and movement. Yeah. Motion. <laughs> motion, motion. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you, because you, you've you both written, um, so Helen, you've got a sole author chapter in there on object interviews, and Sarah, you've written a chapter with your colleagues on food and cooking. So those both fall within the materiality and, uh, and emotion section. So it's interesting that this, this discussion then is is very much centered around around materiality. So I thought I'd only ask you about your own chapters. I won't <laughs> ask you to remember possibly what your, co what your colleagues wrote three years ago. Um, so Helen, I thought your chapter on object interviews again was really interesting because it it, it did what Sophie's book um, also does is it, it kind of explains that you have a you have a very clear understanding of the kind of the nature of materiality or material objects um, and you're kind of um, I think in your research you've been particularly interested in sort of relationships. Would that be Am I interpreting your work correctly here? So material objects as woven into relationships or how would you maybe term it yourself? Yeah, the, the connections, I think that relation that objects enable uh, relationships to, to, to have, I suppose, is the way I think I use the term borrowed again from Jennifer Mason, material affinities. So how we're connected to to objects and things around us and how they connect us to people and places and times gone by, etc. Yeah, yeah. And you give us examples from your own research around material affinity. So you give us examples of how in your interviews you were able to pay attention to the, the very materiality of the objects. And again, I think that is something that that is, I think, unusual in mainstream sociology, at least, um, and might speak to your kind of interdisciplinary background, maybe that your interest in the very materiality. So my, do you sort of... Um, remembering back to your your interviews what was the significance of the materiality of of these objects that people were telling you about i think the thing key really for that particular piece of work was that it wasn't just about the objects it was about the objects in use and it was those objects in use that sort of brought the materiality to life so yeah. it was based on a just to give a bit of background on a project on thrift a three-year project on thrift um, interested in contemporary forms of thrift so I would go into people's homes and would basically be asking them in a roundabout way how they were thrifty and what, what objects they used to be thrifty. 
And what came out from that project is, is that a lot of people had things that had been handed down to them or given to them by relatives, and they were not like the heirloom type, um, you know, things that stay in glass cabinets. They were things like spades or pans or bits of furniture, like everyday uh, furniture that were still very much in use. Um, and uh, participants would talk about how um, the materiality of that object and the memories that it evoked came to life when those objects were in use, such as using the grandfather's spade in the garden or, uh, you know, cutting some bread up with um, the uh, grandmother's bread knife, uh, which was a Sheffield steel one, you know, and, and, and it was those sorts of really poignant sort of moments, but very, again, at that micro level, that mundane level that brought the the object to life, but also the memories or the attachments and affinities um, that were connected to, you know, the relationships with with people who had got who had passed or were still still around, and times and places, etc. Yeah, and I think that also then speaks to the other two themes um, that you're kind of looking at practice. So what these objects are used to do, what people yeah. use them for, and then biography, how they're interwoven in these kind of relational biographies of, of people so that was fascinating and then Sarah your chapter with your colleagues was on food and cooking <laughs> um, and so would you like to say a bit more about these cook-alongs <laughs> yeah sure and, and the discussions you had with people so um, it was part of a project looking at cooking classes as a space for thinking about alternatives to um, or speaking back to austerity measures and thinking about community as a space for kind of eliciting some of that personal and political action. Um, so we we kind of, unusual for some of the work I've done before, we actually went to a specific kind of venue and, and space, whereas usually I would go out and do ethnography that's a little bit more kind of, um, uh, that centres as it goes, rather than go to somewhere specific. But it was really interesting. So we, um, there were these cook-along classes that we went along to. A colleague, Laura Pottinger, was part of the cook-alongs. I went to some, um, and then we did some follow-on interviews afterwards. Um, and this, you know, this chapter was, it was a challenge to write, but I, I thought that if we were asking others to write about their creative methods, then I should have a, a pop at it as well. Um, and so our, the chapter that we have in the book is about how uh, the materiality of food is transformed through cooking practices and that this is something that can be seen in go along methods. And so we look at how the food uh, transforms literally from raw materials to par cooked to kind of these creations to them being eaten together. And it thinks about tracing through that materiality as a method unto itself. Um, so yeah, I found that really interesting. I think one of the things I really enjoyed writing the chapter was um, we'd asked authors in the book to think about how their method could be adapted in, into different spaces or times and practices. So kind of really have to think through, well, where else could this be used? And thinking how we, we could use it in crafts and woodwork, thinking how it could be improved. So we really missed that we should have probably, or we would in future have used some video ethnography work um thinking about dawn uh, lions um uh, time lapse photography so it, it was really nice to kind of write the chapter alongside reading some of the others too and i guess the other thing i wanted to mention that we've not mentioned already is that i think that there's there's a labor when it comes to innovating with methods and whilst it can be exciting and playful there can sometimes be a lot of pressure to to show how your method is rigorous and valuable and fits with certain frameworks and what I've noticed is that a lot of the people doing that work tends to be people earlier in their career and I think there's a real courage and boldness to PhDs and early careers in taking on that work but it comes with a labour to it and so we really wanted to make sure that that, that voice and that group, not that they're homogenous, but that people who were on the cusp of developing new methods were really part of the collection um, and supporting early careers, sometimes in their first experience of writing anything. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully your books will have a big impact on our methodological discussions um, from, from here on in. Uh, in the in the many fields that, that the books cover so you know sociology human geography anthropology and so on and so on um so i want to say a big thank you um to uh, sophie helen and and sarah for taking the time out it's a lovely lovely day outside um you know even though it is manchester <laughs> um 
so thank you all for for talking to me about um, your book so for anyone listening I can heartily recommend uh, Sophie's book Material Methods and Helen and Sarah's edited book Mundane Methods.